If I had to choose just one venue to fish for the rest of my life, then it'd have to be the River Thames. As the country's longest river, there's got to be a thousand different changes of scenery, both rural and the more built up. And as a plus, it's got to have just about every strain of carp imaginable. Scaly ones, leathery ones, long ones and fat ones, it's got the lot. Few have ever been introduced, most have just found their way into the river through high flood water and to me that's one of the main attractions, you just never know what you're going to get. Some of these old carp would have a story to tell I bet, to them it's like the great escape. Out of the river, over the playing fields, down the flooded streams and dikes, maybe a tumble or two across a flooded weir, you know what they're like. The urge to populate new areas is stronger in carp than just about every other species I've ever fished for. With carp, there's always a promised land. I remember one year, my friend Dave, he was doing a little bit of Kingston upon Thames, and he caught a big mirror, 35 pounder, really big fish in fact for the river, and a real familiar one as well, had a couple of big scales on one flank. As it turned out, that fish had escaped not too long before he'd caught it in big flood conditions because this was the summer of 07 and we had some real big summer floods that year and it had escaped and travelled through 17 locks, 60 odd miles, all the way from Reading it had come, recognised fish from a pit in Reading. In fact when it was in the pit in Reading it was a 40 pounder so it dropped a little bit of weight in the river but just think about that 60 odd miles, 17 locks, like I say if they want to go somewhere they'll go. My fishing on the river goes way back, way back to my teenage years when I'd go fishing with friends and with dad and often I'd go on the buses as well. I don't know how I ever used to get away with it. Big clunky seat boxes, stink, stinking keep nets. Thought nothing of it at the time though. Back then, carp were just the unseen monsters that smashed us up, you know, like talking points between friends for weeks and weeks. And then I can remember early one morning, I was bream fishing at Kingston, outside the old gazebo pub. And I remember seeing a matey just down the bank, unravelling a sack at the water's edge. I run down there like you do, all excited, and that was he got there. And he released these two carp, the likes of which I'd never seen before. I was very, very young. I'd caught commons before, but these were mirrors. And they weren't any old mirrors either. They were chestnut brown with black edged fins and the most amazing scales. I'd never seen nothing like it. Looking back, they were either leanies, or if not, they were certainly of that ilk. You know, the image of those two mirrors sliding out of that sack is still burnt into my memory now. And of course, I went on to target them myself, leisuring baits like grilled lunch and meat and trotting lumps of bread flake. And a couple of years on, that's how I caught my first ever River 20, a 21 pound December common on trotted bread flake. I was just 16 then, and ever since, no matter what lake I've been fishing or whatever big one I've had my head into, I've always made sure to have at least a few trips to the river each year, particularly at the start of the season, which is always a good time to catch them off guard. Through those earlier years, any fishing we'd done was generally done from the bank, wherever we could get access really. But then, in 2008, Dad bought himself a little boat, the Lady Pell, and as you can imagine, it wasn't long before I'd acquired the spare set of keys. I'm not so sure it's fair to call them the spare set anymore. The timing for Dad getting that boat turned out to be absolutely bang on, as only the previous year we'd had those huge summer floods, and as it turned out, loads and loads of fish had ended up on our stretch on the lower tidal river. As luck would have it, exactly where we went on to get our moorings. The fishing for those first few years was incredible, and between Dad and myself, and friends that we took out, a couple of hundred carp must have crossed the deck of the Pearl. Just amazing fishing. Dad kicked off that first year with an opening night mirror of 36 pounds. A bit of a monster for the river and a fish which I went on to meet myself a couple of years further down the line. Incredible really, all that river, 100 plus miles to roam. Yet same spot, same place, same time. Who says lightning can't strike twice in the same place, eh? Probably my best boat memories are from the autumn months. Cooler water temperatures, less boat traffic 
and fish which definitely seemed to know what was coming. The tidal river is a really harsh environment for carp to live through the winter months, forever in flood, and so the autumn was a time when they used to feed hard in preparation. It was also a time when we used to fish hard as well, and we'd do as much as we could through that time, dropping in in between tides, regularly baiting, really hard working at it. Timing was always the most important thing. Get it wrong, and the river would be pretty much unfishable. But get it right, and you'd have several hours of stable flow, just like on a non-tidal regular river. Space is fairly tight on the old boat though, and you've got mud weights holding you in position, which you're forever having to keep an eye on. And so playing it safe, we only ever used to use one rod each when we were on the ropes. It wasn't just about the carp fishing either. Back then the river was thriving for all species. In fact, it probably gave me some of the best perch fishing I'll ever experience. Huge great stripies. They were another species which kept us busy through the autumn months. Of course, nothing that good lasts forever and nowadays the fishing is a lot more difficult for all species. There's fewer carp on the stretch, that's for sure, but we still manage to catch at least one or two each year. The best bit is it's forever changing. Every year is different, and you just never know what might have turned up while she'd been away. And so, as always, the boat got its annual spring clean around the beginning of May, and at the same time, the first hit of pre-bait went over the side. Probably around 10 kilos of mixed boilies, along with a good help in the tiger nuts, and whatever rods and ends I had kicking about in the freezer as well. Nothing ever goes to waste when you've got a boat on the river. In all honesty, the actual moorings isn't that great an area, but for filming purposes and fishing overnight, it's ideal, as the jetty actually goes up and down with the tides. So, whereas when I'm afloat, on the mud weights, I'm constantly having to keep an eye on the ropes and the tides. When I'm actually on the moorings, I can relax. Besides, with time and plenty of bait, I've always been able to pull at least a few fish into the area. That's the beauty of the close season. The first three bait ups were each a week apart. But then for that last week or so of the close season, I stepped it up a bit. Baited every couple of days then, generally late in the evenings, once the river had quietened down. The signs were there on each occasion. A little bit of bubbling, the occasional bream turning over. I just hoped that the carp were about. Some years they are, some they aren't. A lot of it depends on the spawning really. But going by the lakes, and we'd had a lot of warm temperatures, I just hoped that they'd already got all that malarkey out of the way. The biggest problem, and the thing that can so often slow the carp action, is them blooming bream. Now, I don't mind half a dozen of them, you know, but any more than that, then it becomes a little bit too much. Seriously, at times they can be absolutely ravenous, especially straight after spawning. So, it was sort of a case of keeping my fingers crossed there, but if I'm honest, I already knew what I was in for. And so finally, the long-awaited date of June the 15th came around. I was there with loads of time to spare before the off at midnight. Several hours early, in fact. Not that I was looking forward to it much. I wanted to get a little bit more pre-baiting. Plus, I still had rigs to tie as well. Only simple snowman rigs. Strong curved shanked hooks, attached to equally strong coated braid. As the carp in the river can pull back a bit, especially if you happen to hook one while that tide is running in. That looks perfect to me. If there's any about, that'll be having them. My own homemade pop-ups, little spicy numbers. They are obviously the, uh, the top bait on the old snowman. And on the bottom bait, I've got complex, but I've dried them out. They're 18 millers, so they've drunk, shrunk down a little bit drier but I've only dried them for about 24 hours or so, and then I've put them in with salt, like so. Seal the salt, and that dries them out further, but it's almost like it dries out the centre of the bait, and the outside, it's almost like it draws the moisture to the surface of the bait. And then what happens is all the salt sticks to it. So you end up with like, let me see, like lovely little frosted, salty, they like that. 
And as for the leads, well, right, I like to fish them on clips so they can drop off because the river is a little bit snaggy in places. The odd boulder, the odd Tesco supermarket trolley, you don't know what's down there. There really isn't any need for finesse on the river, not when you're fishing coloured water, it's quite pacey. Loads of mouths constantly plucking at the hook bait. The most important thing is just keeping the bait on the end and keeping those hooks sharp. As always, the old silver tea slave was whisking away all evening. And as that light started to dwindle, the old canoeist went in too. The countdown started at 11.30. You know, when the old time check started to become a little bit more frequent. Eventually, the hand struck midnight. Hook links had already been looped on hours earlier, so it was just a simple case of casting out to the baited area, line slackened off a little bit, buzzer switched on, but you know what? I didn't even manage to get that second rod out before a bream had hung itself on the first. And from that point on, I knew it was gonna be a long old night. I just had to work my way through them along with a big pile of leads, several look links, but eventually, just before first light, one of the buzzers finally signalled a proper take. You can always tell the difference between the carp takes and the bream takes. Whilst the bream tend to just give you a couple of bleeps, maybe a, a pluck or two on the rod top, the carp melt off, like clutch going at 100 miles an hour, and you can't just hear the clutch. When you're on the boat, you can actually feel the clutch. It's like it's wired up to you. It kind of resonates through the whole boat. Mega. And even once I'd picked up the rod, this fish had just powered off downstream. They just go forever and ever. Eventually managed to stop it, and bit by bit, slowly, slowly, I led it all the way back to the net. The first fish of the season always brings a smile to your face. But if past years have taught me anything, is that where there's one, there's often more. And so first things first, I slipped them into a sack and then I quickly set about getting that rod back out. The tide was already on the up by this point, so basically the flows were reversed. If you imagine, normally off the back of the boat, the flow would be going away from the boat, going down river. So suddenly, once the tide's coming up, it's the complete opposite, the flow's coming towards you. So whereas normally the lines would meet, meet the water off the tips, they'd meet the water probably, I don't know, 20 foot down river from the boat. Once the tide's coming up, they tend to meet the water almost directly below the tips and you get little bits of debris on the line and what have you and, and you're sort of sat there just watching both tips nodding gently with the flow. And when it's like that, any takes tend to come as slack liners, like where a fish has picked up the hook bait and then just dropped down river towards the boat. And that's exactly what that next bite was. I'm sort of sat there watching the old tips and that, like that and all of a sudden, I think it was the right tip, it's just gone bang and then the line's falling slack on the surface. I had to pick up the rod and then reel really frantically to catch up with it, you know, because there's quite a lot of slack line gathering on the surface. And I've caught up with it, and as soon as I caught up with it, it went away from me a little bit, zzz, had a few yards, and then stopped and come towards me so fast that I thought it had come off. But what it was doing, I mean, the line was moving, you just wouldn't believe the speed that these fish travel at. The line is literally going, zzz, cut into the left. So it's, uh, there's a buoy to the left, and it just cleared the buoy, but I know exactly what this fish is doing. It wants to get underneath the jetty to my left. So I've had to jump up out of the boat, pass the, pass the rod round the other line, up onto the jetty, round the pole, and, and just about managed to stop it from getting underneath the jetty. And I mean just. As I say, you're, you're, you're battling the flow just as much as you are the carp. And with that one, I, I had most of the rod under the water, bent right round double, but eventually I managed to get him out. There was a bit of a ladder as well, hanging off the boat to the left. But I managed to get him clear of that. Some, a couple of times the ladder actually lifted where the fish had gone underneath it. But I got him out and even netting the fish is hard work as well. Because you've got the force of the flow and it's literally every time I try to push the net forward it's being dragged underneath the jetty. But loads of to and froing and eventually I've got him into the net.
<laughs> that is why it's hard to play them on a rising tide. <laughs> You really do have to be on your guard when the tide's on the up. Relax for just a second and it's all over. That'll do. It's a little bit rough, definitely a male. They've probably all just been through spawning. But a classic river carp. Bit of a torpedo that one, isn't it? That one's definitely emptied out. They've recently spawned, that's for sure. There you go. The tide sort of got a bit fierce after that. Basically, it takes two hours to come up and another two hours to go down. So I waited until it was on the drop and then I got busy with the old catapult again. I must have put out, I don't know, probably four or five kilos of bait. And you have to take into account the increased depth as, and, and the, the added flow as well when you're putting bait out. If you imagine, I don't know, uh, on, on proper low tide, I was probably fishing in around five foot of water, but on peak high tide, if you can imagine, I'm probably, you can probably add another nine or 10 foot to that and the increased flow as well. So you have to be careful where you put the bait. I chose to put it in, it was quite a big spread of bait anyway, but I put it in probably about 20 foot short of where I was casting, knowing that by the time it hit the bottom, it'd be about right. Another half a dozen hook links were tied up and baited. You know what they say, failure to prepare is preparation to fail. So we don't want none of that malarkey. And then, you know, it's sort of middle of the day by now, you know, not the best time for fishing. Uh, I was shattered as well. So I tried my best to get a little bit of shut eye then, which wasn't so easy as by this point, the boaters were out in force. I managed to cut the bow's kit before getting the rods back out in the afternoon. And just as I'd feared, then Blooming Breen was still there waiting with their mouths open wide. The next carp take came in the early evening and if I'd been lucky with, to get the last one in, then I was even luckier with this one as it sort of took a few yards of line and then swung left around the buoy. I could see the buoy sort of bobbing about and swaying from side to side, but by keeping the tip down real low and just being careful, slowly, slowly, and eventually I managed to just get it to swing back round the buoy all the way back towards the boat. I saw it was a mirror as well, right result, first mirror of the trip. Little bit of two, of two and a throw in under the tip and into the net he's gone. It was another one of the smaller ones, a younger looking fish this time round. There seems to be quite a few of those in the tidal river nowadays, but that's good, bodes well for the future. It's only a small one. That's what I seem to be getting on this stretch nowadays. It's not a bad thing, at least it's got a future. Definitely see he's been through spawning. A couple of little scratches that side. A little rough bit on his gill plate, scale lifted. But ever so plump, don't like, look like it's dropped an ounce. There you go. two-tone and all that. What I was really hoping for was a Thames 20. A mirror would have been nice, but I won't be too picky. The bream seemed to slow down again in the evening, and that's often a good time for the carp as well. I was pretty sure I'd seen one roll and all, just as I was making a recast. 
it was only just, it was just downstream from where I was casting. In fact, the rig was in flight when it rolled. But it just sort of turned over slowly and I see a bit of gold. I don't know, it didn't look like a bream to me. I was, I was feeling quietly confident, pretty sure it was a carp. Pretty unusual stretch of river this. If you imagine the Thames as being a series of tiers, you know, of each level slightly lower than, than the last, basically separated by locks. And this stretch has got the very last lock. If you imagine if they leave that last lock open, but shut the one above it, then it, they can, if they want, they can, they can basically run the water right out of, the, out of the stretch completely. Well, you get a little trickle left through the middle, but that's basically what they do once a year. Start of November, generally lasts about two weeks, and locally it's known as the draw off. I think mainly they do it sort of to carry out repairs and what have you, structural repairs, you know, on the bridges and locks and what have you. But the good thing about it, it gives Dad and I a chance to carry out a little bit of maintenance of our own, if you know what I mean. Once a year, start of November, oh, here we go, bream again, I bet, yeah. Once a year at the start of November, oh, another big old slab. They drain the water right down, so you end up with just a trickle running through the middle of the river. So all the areas where we catch carp from are dry, if you know what I mean. So any snags, branches, debris, supermarket trolleys and what have you that have been dumped in the river over the course of the year, we can basically walk out there and clean them up. There's not many swims you can say that about. And a couple of years back, I remember on the old drawer off, Dad was out there doing his old what do they call it? The Mudman, isn't it? You've seen the old television programs where they're out there, like seeing what they can find. Well, Dad's, Dad's out there doing a bit of that, searching around in the mud. He's just done up this old bream. Where was I? Yeah. Dad was out there cleaning up seeing what little goodies and bits and bobs, trinkets he could find in amongst the mud. And he found, I'll show you it, an old porthole right on our spot where we cast, where we've caught plenty of carp over the years. And he brought it home, didn't look nothing like that, mind. It was all covered in rough stuff and what have you. You could tell it had been at the bottom of the river for years and years. So he brought it home, I gave it a little clean up, and now most of the time that lives in front of my fireplace. A reminder, battles won and battles lost. I wouldn't like to say how much line that one stripped from the clutch, but eventually it slowed up way, way downstream and right across the river. You know, you know when you know it's a better one, but you just don't want to say. It was breezy out there, so there was a bit, bit of a chop on the surface but slowly, slowly I led him all the way back upstream. And it was on the top all the while, beaten really, just floundering on the surface, you know, but still aided by the force of that flow. When they're behaving calm like that, I don't like to anger them too much. I just, instead I like to just carefully tease them in, you know, slowly, slowly catchy monkey, no rush. It was a better one all right, but if I'm honest, still not quite as big as I was expecting from, from a battle so fierce. Typical river carp, all tense, bristling, angry. And that's definitely one of the proper old original fish for this stretch. Proper tidal river carp. That's what we were after, a better one. Mean and lean would probably be the best way to describe it, a proper old battler. It was exactly what I'd been hoping for though, an opening day Thames 20 and with a pound or so to spare. The only thing with the river is it can get a bit busy at times. You know, you, you have to remember that it belongs to everybody, especially in the daytime. So you've got loads of boat traffic, you know, the towpaths are always busy as well. You've got joggers and dog walkers up and down. But come night time, well, 
evening, night and early mornings, that's when it belongs to the anglers. That last take came completely out of the blue. I was sort of just laying back in the cabin, eyes shut but not, not asleep. And I heard a couple of bleeps followed by a purring clutch, you know. Da -da 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 -zzz. What, why the buzzer didn't carry on, I don't know. I, I'd been getting that many bream that maybe I hadn't put the line back in the roller properly, I'm not sure. But it was obvious it was a carp take and as soon as I picked up the rod it done just the same as all the others. Zzz, loads and loads of line downstream but add a little bit more weight to it. It was a little bit more ponderous, you know. It ground to a halt miles away, but it was almost on the same line as the buoy as well. So I had to keep the rod well out off the side of the boat. Just like the others, that last fish fought as though it was for its life. Heavy thumping once it was under the tip, you know, big explosions. But eventually, into the net it's gone. That was a nice one. Deep and chunky, little withered fins, pecs. Lovely little tail. It had damaged the tail, but you could see it had happened a long, long time ago and it had sort of healed itself, but in a way which gave it character, you know. He's been through the wars at some stage. He's either done that spawning, or who knows, maybe even took a tumble over a weir. In fact, if that was in the lake, I would say it was of damage, but do you know what? In the Thames, or certainly down this far, I don't think so. Be more likely to be seals down this neck of the woods. There's one I'd never seen before as well, a carp with no name. All along, all I'd been hoping for was a Thames 20, but to catch two, a common and a mirror, well, that just made it a traditional start to remember. Long live June the 16th, that's what I say. Cheerio. <laughs>